going to get started in just a little bit when I can confirm that this new setup is working and that you can actually hear me. I think it should be live. I'm not sure. <laughs> Looks live to me. I think that has now been shared everywhere it needs to be. Um, currently there is no one on the stream, but I'm going to talk to you as if there is, because obviously people can watch this stuff after it's already concluded. Um, so as a, again, hopefully you can hear me, I've got 
like a creaky chair and an AC right next to my microphone, but that's the best that I can do with this setup. Um, my name is Benjamin Moeller. I'm a paleontologist based in southern Arizona, and um, I have just completed the first year of my project, the Parent Teacher Guide to Paleontology, which is hosted on uh, Patreon, where I kind of give away as much information as I can that I've learned as a paleontologist in my uh, short career thus far. I've been in the game for about 15 years, um, but I'm only 24, so there's still a lot of different things that I gotta do. Um, and I, I think I will definitely talk about throughout the stream kind of what it's like in this industry and why I'm doing this and not other things, and what I'm getting out of uh, working on PT Paleo and what I hope other people get out of it as well. And uh, as I kind of jabber on and on over the next few hours, um, I'm taking photographs of some of my specimens under the microscope that I can use for PT Paleo. My uh, research notes are released twice a week, one on a fossil species and one on an extant species, something that's still alive. And uh, for um, Fossil Friday, which obviously comes out on Fridays, I tend to use um, some of the stuff it are things that I photographed under a microscope, some of it are things that I've seen in public collections and um, some of it is stuff that I found out in the field, some of it is stuff I've acquired at various gem shows, so and what we're currently looking under is a little home microscope that I got, um, I think at the end of high school, so my dad got this for me. And it's gotten quite a bit of use, although not not nearly as much as I would want to. Um, in high school, I didn't really have much uh, to do with a microscope like this. It's not like we were doing projects in biology that required it, unfortunately. But um, when I got into college, I started a job at the Laboratory of Paleolimnology. Um, that's a uh, laboratory that studies ancient lakes and whatnot. I'm going to one second. Gotta set up my voice audio thing here. Have fun looking uh, under the hood. <laughs> okay. I think I'm just going to leave it as is. So, what you're looking at right now is the tooth of Ankylosaurus. This is a very well-known late Cretaceous herbivorous dinosaur. I believe this specimen comes from the Hell Creek Formation, which is also a very well-known... Uh, geological entity. It's uh, mostly in Montana is where you see the Cretaceous in Montana. Um, but you, you can find exposures of it uh, throughout kind of those northern plain states. Now we're looking really close at the enamel of this guy. Check 
check that out. I can mess with uh, various settings on here to change how the image looks. So yeah, today I'm just kind of messing around, getting myself reacquainted with this. Ooh, I like that contrast. Although I am a fan of blue, if you couldn't tell. It's kind of making everything blue. I really like messing with the color temperature on this thing because it makes all this like kind of abstract art look and stuff. Let's see. When you get up this close, it can be hard to get a large area in focus. That's really cool. So yeah, when I was in uh, college, I started this job at the Laboratory of Paleolimnology, and the pandemic hit um, when I was in my, I guess you could call it my junior year, I suppose. Um, I didn't exactly follow a strict kind of that expected four-year uh, run in college because I joined with enough credits to be considered a sophomore technically, but I also took more than four years to finish two degrees. So um, it's kind of hard to say like what my junior year was, what my senior year was. It's all kind of a blur, especially once the pandemic started, which I think is something a lot of people can relate with. But um, yeah, once all that happened and the laboratory had to close down, I still needed a job. Um, it wasn't a very high paying thing. I was getting like 11 bucks an hour to do this kind of stuff. Just looking at fossils under a microscope. I was sorting through sediment uh, taken out of a lake in East Africa. Um, and that's being used for various types of um, sort of climate analysis and things like that. I can talk more about that at some point if anyone's interested. But there is still no one on the stream. So I'm going to talk about whatever I want. pull that guy up. I'm going to try to keep uh, in the corner over here. Of course they don't shrink these down small enough to not cover like half the screen. What a pain. <laughs> yeah, that's not really gonna work for me. So anyway, uh, we all get sent home during the pandemic. I still want to work. And so we, we work out this arrangement where I'm able to continue doing what I was doing previously. Um, but on this home microscope, which I had already set up at my apartment uh, and I wasn't using it for anything else. So it, you know, it came in handy and the work was really, you know, it was it's mindless work and I actually kind of enjoy that because um, a lot of like being a scientist and, and writing and doing all that crap means having to like sit down and like read and think and process and sometimes I just want to do something that doesn't require any amount of my brain to, to pull off and working under the microscope is kind of like that. It's just a lot of manual um, picking at things and yeah, yep, mic's on. <laughs> just a lot of looking at stuff, 
and most of the time you're not really going to find much of anything. And even when you do, you don't have to think that hard about it. You just mark down like, hey, I found this amount of charcoal at this particular thing, and that's about it. You know, so it's it's kind of just like counting 1 to 20 usually is sufficient. Let's take a look at the root. Let's get closer at that root. Nice. Let's see if I can get even closer at those striations on the root there. brightness a little bit. Cool. And while the pay obviously isn't a ton, um, when you're in this kind of line of work in paleontology, you learn to take what you can and I managed to feed myself on that wage, um, you know, with help from family, but I was working to supplement all that stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I got by during the pandemic on that. I was trying to find another job. I applied to work at, like, this was the point in time where there's all these calls to work in, like, grocery stores, and there was not even a hope of a vaccine at that time. Um, we didn't know how long we were going to be in lockdown and, you know, it's like, well, someone needs to work in the grocery stores. Um, I'm young, I've got a good immune system, so it's less risky for me to do that kind of work and I need the money, so let's do this. And believe it or not, uh, <laughs> I did not get hired anywhere that I applied. Which was weird, and was kind of distressing. And uh, it's something that has continued. Basically ever since. So, uh, yeah, I graduated with my two degrees in December of 2021. And... Um, I had, I had already determined at that point I wasn't going to go straight into graduate school. When you're a paleontologist, you really kind of do need um, at least a master's degree, if not a PhD, to do most types of things, to qualify for lots of different types of jobs. And the experience you get while uh, earning a PhD is actually invaluable. So even if you don't want to be in academics, having that PhD is, is a very useful thing. However... Um, I had been in school since I was like three up until that point. I had gone from high school straight into college and I was intending on being in college for quite a while longer. You know, your, your PhD and your graduate studies, those can add a decade or more onto your time in school. And I had honestly gotten to the point where I didn't like being in school very much. Um, I had never, to be quite honest, loved it, but, um... I was getting pretty burnt out. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to give myself some time. Also, everything changed during the pandemic as far as how you're supposed to go from, you know, how you even get into graduate school and how you meet people, uh, you know, meet advisors and make those connections. All of that changed because it used to be very reliant upon conference attendance and stuff like that. And I'd even managed to get out to a conference during the pandemic, uh, GSA in Portland, uh, with the intent of <laughs> trying to find any kind of, uh, you know, master's or PhD program that looked attractive. And I spent all this time writing a very long, uh, manuscript that will be a paper someday 
I'm hoping to submit it before the end of the year, but I basically drafted it in my last semesters at college, brought it to conference, hoping to use what I had had worked on to try to find a program. And uh, no one, it, w it was a disaster. There wasn't anyone else, when I was supposed to present my poster, my entire row was empty and I barely got to talk to anyone. <laughs> and basically all the advisors at that point were like, I'm not, I'm not spending the money. Uh, this was the time when uh, flights were suddenly being canceled in the thousands, literally that same weekend. Um, my flight out to Portland was one of that first ones canceled. And then some of my subsequent flights for the following days also canceled. So understandably, a lot of people didn't go. And that means I had a very limited, you know, ability to talk to people about doing a program. And if you can't meet academics in conference settings and if you can't get them to answer your emails which has also been a really big issue um, I just have a very hard time getting people to respond when I reach out I think a lot of people have, have had that problem for a long time but it's it's definitely worse now where um, academics especially are just very dodgy about that kind of thing and while I understand not wanting to give all of your time to, like, you know, oh, God, I've, I've only got five minutes off for the next week, and I'm not going to spend it trying to, you know, get this sweetheart deal for, for this undergrad, you know, kind of fend for yourself, kid. Like, I understand why people get into that situation, but it also means that um, students in my position get stuck and stuck trying to find something else to do. In a lot of people's case, that would be working in industry. But unfortunately, paleontology as an industry um, barely exists. It's a very small... Um, I guess it's both more widespread and kind of uh, more limited than you would imagine. You know, it's, it's really not like there are jobs in every city. There's like one job at a time available in major cities. And you're competing for that job with every other paleontologist in the country who currently needs a job, which is uh, a lot of them. So we have what we call like a, a degree creep where you know, because everything is so highly competitive, you need to be, um, you, you really need to be top of the line to get anywhere. And oftentimes, we're, we're not talking about luxurious compensation or anything. So it's a, it's a very difficult situation. And uh, I think a I think there's a lot of students like me who got caught up in all these changes happening all at once in the world. And, uh, you know, it's not like there's an established system that everybody follows. So there's not an agreed upon way to make sure that people in my situation are completing our end of the pipeline, you know, getting into these graduate programs. We've now moved on from the ankylosaur tooth to look at um, a scattering of small teeth from a Bull Canyon. And I'm going to see if I can pull up any information on that. Okay. Uh, Bull Canyon formation from the Triassic of San Miguel County in New Mexico. I've got um, some images. <laughs> That should help uh, take some guesses, I guess, as far as like what each of these belong to. But um, the Triassic is when the dinosaurs first kind of show up. Um, but when they appear in the fossil record, uh, they're accompanied by numerous other types of reptiles, 
including the ancestors of modern crocodilians, but um, a lot of stuff back then that looked like crocodilians that are not related to them at all. They're extinct relatives. So this, for example, I believe is a non-dinosaurian uh, carnivore tooth, a Rivueltosaurus, possibly. Um, I think that species might have been uh, recently amended. Let me put it back where it was. So like right here, you can see grooves on that enamel, those little kind of black lines, and then uh, very good resolution on those denticles. See if we can get closer on those. Anyway, when the job market is a nightmare and you can't really get work in what you're trained to do, you find yourself in kind of a sticky situation, uh, professionally, financially, academically, all that stuff. So um, starting the Parent-Teacher Guide to Paleontology um, about eight months or so after I graduated was a reaction to the fact that eight months had passed and I didn't have a job. I had been applying to stuff, not just in paleontology, but across diff, you know, different related industries that I believed I had a good chance at um, applying my skills in. When you specialize in, in something like this, you have to be smart about you know, having a backup plan, being uh, trained in a lot of different fields, and you know what? Um, Sometimes uh, you can prepare as much as possible. Uh, you can you can be as prepared as possible and still not have stuff work out. And that doesn't mean you failed. That's just life. That's what Jean Luc Picard taught the world, I believe. The Parent-Teacher Guide to Paleontology is um, basically my attempt to give myself homework, <laughs> which is not something I would have expected I would ever really want to do, but, you know, after after so... Ooh, check that out. Look at how that brings out the... Uh, brings out those spots. That's very cool. Just a little too shiny. Yeah. Of course, when you do that, all those other features go away. <laughs> Isn't that something? So it was my attempt to figure out something to keep myself busy that is productive and allowing me to keep building my skills and uh, also build, um, what do you call it, you know, a, um, it's a demo reel in video, but it's a, a portfolio in, like, written stuff. You know, I need a portfolio of, you know, scientific writing that isn't peer-reviewed research. Um, Part of my strategy for making sure that I didn't have a hard time going from my undergraduate to my graduate was that I got two papers out when I was an undergrad. I foolishly hoped that that would, uh, um, that having that experience and having gotten that done would, would uh, make me a more attractive candidate. Turns out the standards have raised so much that um, that's not especially impressive <laughs> apparently but um, you know you don't get paid unless you have like um, an academic appointment or you're being paid by a grant or it's part of your education which is also paid for by a grant um, 
you, you don't get paid to do research by default. So I wrote this paper and I contributed to another one. I got paid um, to process samples for that first paper. Um, but on the second one, that was all just me writing in my spare time. I basically set aside uh, the summer of 2020 to uh, drafting this article that was then published in uh, April of 2021. And that was fine because I was in school, so I didn't have to have, you know, I didn't have to have everything lined up right away. But unfortunately, um, you know, it, it just is a factor of how I have to make decisions about what I spend my time on. So PT Paleo came around as, you know, a way for me to put my skills to use and hopefully provide something that other people could use as well. Um, PT Paleo is both deeply personal because it's all my work. Um, there's a, a huge emphasis that I placed on myself when planning for this project to have everything as original as possible. Um, it's all my original writing and I'll get more into how I've managed to do that what well, my strategy was. Um, it's all original writing. It's all original photography. Um, I haven't been using anything that isn't, you know, directly made by me because this is supposed to be a, sh a showcase of what I can do and what I've learned. Um, and at the same time, I'm putting that to hopefully to use for types of people who want to, oh, this is the image. That's why. That's why all those tabs aren't doing anything. I'm not looking at it anymore. Okay. Nope. Fit to height. And, um, it officially launched one year ago, more or less. Um, I just released my 52nd edition of both Wildlife Wednesday and Fossil Friday. And because those are once a week, 52 weeks, there you go, one year. That's kind of how I've calculated it. That is so cool. I've heard of Bluetooth, but this is ridiculous. And, um, you know, the object, uh, the idea was to have, at the end of the day, um, give myself an excuse 
to do something I've I've wanted to do the whole time, which is, you know, brush up on fundamentals, but also um, just spend more time just reading and just processing original scientific works and thinking about how that informs uh, or how that might change what I just spent all these years and all this time and all this money um, learning about in school and then hopefully make something that can translate that knowledge um, into something other people find useful and to me I feel like the people who most appreciate that kind of guidance um, are parents and teachers people who you know like my parents when I first you know when I when I decided I was going to do paleontology and there was there was nothing else nothing else was going to really interest me and capture my attention um, this this was it I figured it out and I figured that out quite early on um, you know no one in my family had, had ever done anything like this so it was new for everybody And, you know, that situation is not unusual. As the bard says, um, my dreams are not rare. And so there's people, you know, all the time who decide that paleontology is what they want to do. And there are people in their lives who want to help, but they don't have necessarily, um, you know, they don't necessarily know where to go, where to begin. They don't have that ready to go. It's it's not an obvious process at all. You know, paleontology is a very difficult field to break into, as I have... Uh, basically, anyone will tell you, but I know I've talked about it ad infinitum for a very, very long time. So, you know, while while I figure out what it means to be a paleontologist at my, de at, at my stage of career in the year 2023, whatever that means, I can, even if I don't have all the answers for what my path is supposed to be, I can still help people establish the fundamentals and get a foothold and just disseminate information that I've been collecting for all this time. You know, I've been looking for a reason, an excuse to just sit down and write um, about all kinds of different things and do it in a in an official and um, you know in, in a in a in a capacity that's not it's not just for an assignment it's not for something I'm I'm just one and done no one's ever gonna look at it like um, I fully intend for this patreon to be something I can lean on and do f forever I think there will always be a, a need in my life uh, for something like this. And so the past year has been an experiment in ex figuring out what can I do that other people find interesting and useful enough that they will actually pledge support. And that has probably been the most difficult part, honestly. I've never been great at advertisement. It's not something I'm comfortable at. It's not something that comes naturally to me. Um, but it's obviously quite essential for having a, a, a surviving, um, you know, online community, online project, educational project. You need to be able to sell yourself to some capacity. And it's just not something I really like doing. But all that said, um, I've been very happy with the results. Um, it's always a little intimidating when you say, "All right, this is it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do. Th this is the big thing. You know, I'm gonna do this, and I don't know if I'm gonna succeed. I don't know if the end product is going to be something I'm happy with or that other people find useful." And those first six months or so, I mean, um, it was definitely uh, a little bit difficult to put all this effort in after spending all this time, 
you know, trying to be very intentional and, and just ha- hitting that wall of um, how do you get your work out there? How do you set aside the shame that you naturally feel about having to quote unquote self advertise and just, you know, be honest with people about here's what I can do, here's how you can support me. Um, if you're in, you're in. If not, I understand. <laughs> Have a good day. Doing that is not my is not why I'm in paleontology. I'm in paleontology because I love reading, and because I love just biting into something substantial that doesn't have a lot of definitive answers, that is constantly changing. I see there is one viewer. Hello. If you would like to say hi, uh, there is a little chat thing and I can see it. If you have any questions, um, I am just messing around with some of these Triassic teeth from Bull Canyon in New Mexico and uh, having fun with the light filters. We're making abstract art, I guess. Howdy, howdy. Um, and yeah, also, also just talking about um, since it has been one year since I decided to launch this project, um, the circumstances that led me to do that and what I'm thinking of doing with it in the future. Um, year two obviously begins right away. There's more research articles set for next week. I've got a blog ready for next week where I uh, argued with ChatGPT for quite a while about paleontology and I think I have something maybe interesting or useful to say about how I think those programs think and what they do and do not understand. (laughs) Um, But the research articles is just the beginning. It's just, you know, I would say right now my output on Patreon is about I'm I'm doing about a quarter to a third of the total amount of like content I want to produce. Um, I've got research articles, I got bonus blogs, I've got Q and A's, um, and I make expedition videos. But there's also lots of just essay topics that I mean a lot of other people who have kind of made hay as a communicator of science or just a prominent you know public figure in paleontology they do it through um, a lot of people do it on YouTube and what's kind of stopped me from just jumping head first into making videos which is something I have experience doing is that enough people have done it before that if I'm gonna if I'm gonna do it I'm going to have to do it, you know, it, it's going to be the definitive, like, no one else would do it this way. Um, I have to tackle topics that haven't already been retread over and over and over again, because, frankly, a lot of the online community in paleontology just loves retreading the exact same thing over and over and over again. And I get... I, I get really easily um, really easily jaded about repetition. So this tooth I'm trying to uh, focus on is is white in coloration except for the tip and the bloom is is such that I just can't get it to it's just so washed out. I haven't used really this microscope super intensely uh, since I did my 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 university job with it. Uh, back during the pandemic. So partly I'm just kind of reacclimating myself to how all this stuff works. That tooth in the center there, I think... I think... Let's see. Let's take a closer look. (laughs) 
I haven't ever uh, streamed under this before. So what you're looking at, um, at my microscope, at the very top, is a little tube where the camera um, attaches. And so I have to pull a lever that basically blinds the, um, the eyepieces. So it, it blocks out where you're supposed to use this, like, you know, the eyepieces of the microscope. And instead, you've got the camera. The camera is streaming to a program called Amscope, and then OBS is broadcasting the Amscope uh, to YouTube. So you are watching me manipulate fossils live from my, from my little home studio, which is cool. Um, MicroStream is definitely part of my year two plan for what to do with this project. Um, and while I'm, I'm just focusing on photography today, I might put some of these teeth, I might put these teeth away for now, just so we can look at some other stuff. I've got so many things that I can go through. Um, but in future, I'm going to try to, um, I mean, do the same thing I did uh, for my job, which is sort um, microfossils under the microscope. Um, let's see, what do we got here? Pseudopilatus from Bull Canyon. So these are more teeth from the same place. Little crocs, croc-like animals, I should say. There we go. There we go. Should be in focus now. So these are from the Triassic. They are over 200 million year old. And you can uh, still see the little serrations on it. Isn't that cool? See what this guy looks like close up. So these are all fossils that have been picked out of sediment, um, collected in these formations. You don't just go walking around in the desert and randomly find something that, let me, let me get my finger for scale, <laughs> if at all possible. Let me get my finger for scale. Uh, that. Can't even really see it. Something that is much smaller than my fingernail. You don't just walk out into the desert and find that. Um, you uh, you have to collect dirt first, <laughs> and then look at it under a microscope, and uh, wash it basically to separate out um, things into different particle sizes, and then go by by each batch. Let me get this other light going and see what that does. Part of the reason I'm doing a test stream today instead of the, uh, the main event is again because, uh, you know, once my job ended, there wasn't really a reason for me to be, for, to be doing this. Um, you know, sorting microfossils is fun when you're getting paid to do it, and it's also obviously important for research. Um, microfossils tell us an incredible amount about ecosystems that, like, large fossils just can't. Um, but again, when you're, when you're in this kind of uh, position, you have to think about, like, how, what can I actually afford to just do for free? Versus, like, am I actually undercutting my ability to get a job by doing this stuff uh, just because? It's not the, not the most fun of circumstances because I just want to do science and not have to worry about, like, am I making things more difficult for myself and for other people? But 
that's the real world and uh it is what it is but um you know i i can make this worthwhile for everyone by turning uh sorting stuff under the microscope into something that other people can observe and participate in and so my hope is to go out and collect um sediment from a couple of different places around Arizona and New Mexico um, and and maybe other places who knows and then process that obviously off camera and then just every now and again maybe maybe twice a month maybe more often than that if people really like these streams um, you know just sitting just sitting down spending a few hours on uh, maybe a weekday maybe on the weekends I haven't really decided yet just sorting through microfossils and seeing what we find. Um, I think probably the, the, the most popular content that I made for Patreon in this last year have been the expedition videos where I go out into um, the field to do my regular job, which is collect fossils. And on top of that, I added the responsibility of doc, you know video documenting what's going on with all the various sensitivities that have to be paid to that and then editing and uploading that content from the field so that um, my expedition donors can see what I'm up to on that exact same day that I'm out there and um, that stuff then passes into uh, the public domain I guess um, after a couple of months and so those videos all went live in the last month and Let's see. Let's look at the statistics here. So, um, in that in the last month, my uh, subscribers on Patreon have jumped by about forty percent. Uh, definitely the the biggest single uh, jump in in attention on the project, which is fantastic. I was really really glad that, um, and this was a big push from me to try to get, you know get get this work out there and get more people uh, aware of the project and what's going on. So I'm, I'm glad that that did work. And um, I'm hoping that doing more regular video content is one way that I can continue to engage people who don't necessarily like you know, have, have a need in their life for like, you know, I, I want to do this professionally or I've got someone a student that I'm mentoring that has a passion for this because um, there's far more people that are just kind of casually like "Ooh, cool a fossil um, I really like that purple color on this guy isn't that cool of course that is partly the tint on the filter but Mess with the light a little bit. So more live streams is one of the things I want to do in this next year. Um, I have to make a decision on whether I want to adjust my, um, what do you call it? Purple is best, pops excellently with the lighter green. Yeah, I agree. For sure. Kind of Halloween-y colors. Um, but basically, Patreon allows you to pick different tiers um, of, like, what services you, you want to utilize that they provide. And something you can do is have a full shop, basically a full store in the same vein as, like, a red bubble. Um, and so like part of what I want to do in the second year is make in, make more infographics, make posters because there is a dearth I will say, there is a, a distinct need for uh, scientifically accurate posters <laughs> because just walking into any given museum I, I always check them to see what the quality of stuff is and it's not what I would hope, it's not what I would want for, you know, the 
the you know the kids and the enthusiasts who want factual information so i want to work on more of that stuff i might just make straight up prints you know like part of my wildlife photography is just getting good at photographing animals and um frankly the audience for cool animal photograph is a lot bigger than um uh <laughs> you know paleontologist writes about living animals as part of their personal learning and part of a consultant outreach, whatever, yada, yada, yada. Um, so that might be one way that I try to um, really give this project a boost. But part of, um, part of the reason why that wasn't one of the first things that I did is that I strongly believe, let's see, um, th this whole thing is, is built on the idea of doing original work, partly because it makes it, it, it forces me to go to the original scientific works, original papers, and all that stuff and and actually like read the original material for myself not what subsequent authors have written about not what teachers have said or summarized and certainly not what like the internet summarizes these things as um because i have definite i have definitely come to learn um since getting into college just how um unreliable a lot of like internet content is um you know i went for for writing my research articles twice a week i basically so i do use wikipedia but um in the sense that when i'm done writing an article i will go and check to see what wikipedia wrote about and as you would hope a lot of the times because i'm i'm going directly to the scientific papers and Wikipedia is supposed to draw from those original documentations into a more digestible, um, uh, into a more digestible form. You would, uh, you would hope that they would be similar, right? And sometimes it is, sometimes we got the same information. Um, because I'm using, uh, certain tools that I think the average Wikipedia editor doesn't, um, I find a lot of times I've got, I've, I've referenced things that just don't appear on those wiki pages, which is cool for, you know, cool for me. Um, but also like, I always assumed that, you know, this stuff was, was way more heavily scrutinized now. And certainly when I was, when I was thinking about like contributing to editing Wikipedia back in my early teens before I, I tossed that idea, I'm like, I, I don't want it. This community is just so high strung and uh, like non-invitational and all that stuff. All right, I think I'm gonna quit messing with this and just take this as a picture. Let's make sure I've got one. Ray says, make prints with facts about the animal plant on the flip side of the photo. Um, yeah, I'm, there's, a, there's a lot of different uh, forms that I thought about. Um, I make all these images for my research notes that are like detailed with like um, labeling and stuff like that. Um, and so I think that kind of thing works on its own and that I could potentially just, you know... Um, uh, subscribers get access to the full resolution image on Discord. So you can just open that, download it, and you can just print that if you want to. Um, but I'm hoping to provide something with a little bit higher fidelity. Save. This is... Pseudopilatus tooth one. Um, but like when you, when you start talking about two, two sided stuff, I usually think about like trading cards and I would love to like, when, when I was a kid, 
um, I always say it, it was really good for my bank that I was never into like any trading card games or Pokemon because I would have lost all of my money literally trying to collect everything. I have this unbearable impulse when I notice that there's like different versions of the same thing that I like that part that just caveman part of my brain is like, you, you have to get all of them, obviously. Um, and so the closest I ever came was in uh, national geographic kids used to have these little, every single monthly issue, you would get this little pack kind of booster pack of little, just little cardboard. Um, not, not even that like card stock, uh, trading cards that had different animals and stuff on it. And I love those things. So I think it would be cool to make stuff like that again. But um, the big roadblock here is that I'm a researcher, not an artist. And it would take a lot of time for me to, like, I would have to really practice a lot of fundamentals. And it would probably take at least another year before I'm like, yeah, I can I can illustrate something to a degree that I don't feel ashamed of trying to like sell it, you know. Um, so partly I'm kind of hamstrung in that sense that it's just another skill that I need to find time to refine before I really feel uh, feel like I can do it justice. Um, the other thing is that, like, there are so many talented artists who do constructions of ancient animals and ancient ecosystems, um, and they're more than happy to, to illustrate, you know, all kinds of things. You just have to commission. And um, part of what, you know, if, if I can actually get an excess, you know... Um, Part of what I want to be able to use Patreon funds for, besides like vehicle maintenance and gas and stuff to get me into the field to do the expedition videos, um, I would also love to be able to actually commission artists to make assets that I can use, um, you know, on, on basically everything. Like the expedition videos can, can definitely use little, you know, illustrations of an animal. Um, the research notes could use it. I can do all kinds of stuff as far as prints and, and trading cards and God knows what else. Um, you just need to come up like, you need to come up with a fair rate because uh, artists get screwed over all the time, all the time. And the point is that I'm trying to um, invest in those artists and invest in the community and not just needlessly, you know, make things worse for them. Or, or, you know, in the same way that, like, you know, I want people to treat researchers and, and think about involving researchers in their projects more often um, so that more people like me. What happened? Where did the teeth go? This happens sometimes where I just kind of lose what I was looking for. <laughs> Gotta bring it back. There he is. Why he purple? Just kidding, I know that's my fault. How many microfossils do you find in a sample on average? So, um, when I was processing the Lake Tanganyika stuff, it would totally depend on what layer. Um, and it also depends on, like, if, if we're only talking about vertebrates, you, the average sample might have, like, a couple of teeth in it. Fish teeth, usually. A couple of fish bones, maybe. Um, and sometimes you'd have a decent amount of charcoal in it. Sometimes there's no charcoal. Sometimes it's only charcoal. 
Let's get some more neon colors going on. Do you think people would buy a print of just like a neon tooth just for fun? I hope so. I'll try to get a non uh, a non tinted picture of this, and then we'll get creative. But uh, yeah, it's it's hard to tell, and that's part of why I need to do more tests. Like I, I need to do I need to do some test runs before streaming, just so that I don't like spend all day searching through stuff with nothing to show. I feel like people might not like watching a stream where nothing happens. Although, you know, I mean, I see what goes on on Twitch, and there's a whole lot of just nothing that gets all kinds of attention, so I don't know. And that's the other funny thing is, you know, I've been on the internet for a long time. I'm 24. Um, I was using YouTube back in 2005 when it first launched. Like, I... I remember back when the idea of someone making money on YouTube or on the internet in general was a total, a, a laughable concept that is now like, for, for whole industries, that's all people do is they just get paid to post on the internet as long as they invoke this, you know, talk about the right product and, and so on and so forth. And so like knowing that that science and paleontology is such a difficult field to break into and all that stuff. I've of course been thinking this entire time, like how do I find my little corner? How do I learn from the very visible mistakes I see other people making all the time, you know, at this stuff, people who are super successful change or sell out or just crash and burn because they're, they've got like, I don't know, bad personal politics or whatever. Um, I've been thinking for a very long time about how to, um, how to do this kind of thing. And I won't claim that I figured it out perfectly, <laughs> but, um, you know, part of the problem is that there really aren't that many places. It's not that hard to find, like, you know, a, a paleontology discord, paleontology subreddits, paleontology, um, Twitter groups and stuff like that, they're not hard to find. The problem is there's not many places made for people like me um, because, you know, forums and, and other kinds of places, they have a kind of culture of, like, no, you know, no, no one who does this for profit is allowed to post about their stuff. Um, for example... You know, I can't just exactly freely share my expedition videos everywhere because it's seen in that kind of forum culture as like attempting to game, attempting to game the system by submitting your own content versus putting out content and then just hoping someone else not only sees it, but likes it enough to share. Um... There's all kinds of subtle rules about how this stuff is supposed to work. And and honestly, it feels sometimes just impossible to figure out how I'm supposed to... How I'm supposed to share what I do and why it seems like there's so much resistance in spaces where you would think they would enjoy having a paleontologist around to, like, ask questions and, um, you know, learn about new things in the field. It... It honestly is quite lonely when you're in this kind of career stage where, um, you know, like the, the big established professors, they don't ever have to worry about their videos, if they even care, if they even make that kind of stuff. They don't have to worry about it disseminating. Like, people will do that for them. Um, when you're just starting out, it's a very different story. And if you're not careful, you can get, like you can get a reputation for trying for, as, as like an astroturfer almost of like trying to force yourself to become, you know, recognized or whatever. And it's just like, man, I, I, I make, I make my research things. I make cool little images. I work with fossils. I make videos about it. 
w- you know, you would imagine that it would be easier to kind of uh, market that, but it, it really is quite hard. The door is opening behind me because my co-host roommate has just returned from Macy's. And Target. And Target. What have you found? Uh, I'm just looking at stuff. I, I, I found stuff I had already acquired earlier. I'm, I'm taking uh, pictures awesome. of various things. It's a little crock tooth. Cool. I'll be putting the stuff away. So other statistics for first year of doing this project. Um, As I said, um, 17 subscribers. I'm really, really, really um, grateful for everyone who kind of has rolled the dice, not necessarily knowing what it was I was going to do with this. Um, Because like I said, I'm only doing like a quarter to a third of of the total amount of stuff I want to make for this project. So there's still a lot in store, um, but especially those who joined early on, just based off of like, this is someone that I know who really, really is trying to make their way in science, and they need a little bit of support. Um, that that kind of stuff is is just essential. It's it, it's impossible really to make your way without that kind of support. Um, so. That's awesome. I'm I'm going to keep doing everything I can to expand that and bring more people on board so that I can justify spending way more of my time uh, working on this kind of stuff. I don't really see it as a full-time job because it doesn't give full-time wages, obviously. <laughs> um, but sometimes you pull it off. Sometimes you get really lucky. And it, it would be incredible to be able to do even more of this stuff. I honestly surprised myself in how much I've produced just in the last year. I wasn't keeping track of, of like, how much text I had written, um, like, between the research notes and the Q&A and stuff like that. As of this afternoon, as of when I started this stream, because I published an article at noon... Um, I have published 86,412 words on the Parent-Teacher Guide to Paleontology. Um, Of that, about 5%, or about 5,000 words, was just the glossary, um, which which was what was posted at noon. So I finally, after a year, got around to um, writing, trying to write definitions for all the terms that I, that I keep using. Um, and it's, it's not complete. Like there's, there's so many other things that still need to be added on there. And most of what I've written about only has a couple of sentences. So, um, I will, I will keep, (laughs) I will keep updating that, um, that glossary over time. Um, but I was really jazzed when I realized that I was on target to surpass 80,000 words in this first year. Because 80,000 words is like at the average length of, of a book. And so that was really cool proof to me that should I decide to sit down and, and like write a novel that like I, I can actually output that amount in a reasonable time frame and not even realize it. Um, and speaking of, I have gotten some questions about this. So I should, you know, it's the one year anniversary stream. I can make some fun announcements. Um, This will be a book eventually. Uh, The parent teacher guide to paleontology is kind of a double entendre because I'm the parent teacher guide, but I'm also producing the parent teacher guide, which will eventually be a physical item that I hope to distribute through the Patreon page. Um, A kind of like three ring binder sort of like, you know, so, so you're not like folding on the spine of a book or anything and just, you know, as many of the images as I as I'm able to uh, freely publish, there's like copyright questions on some of on some of them that I still need to resolve. 
even though everything is my original photography, um, when you do photography of fossil specimens in other collections or of stuff on display in museums, you shouldn't assume by default you have rights to uh, use those in in a commercial activity. So, um, I can't I can't just like print out everything I've made onto pages and call it a day. So it, it, I don't have the book ready to go. I can't announce that I'm doing that right away. Um, and I also have a lot more that I need to write, a lot more like connective tissue between all of the different articles. Um, so I, I've still got a ways to go on all of that, but absolutely my intent is to um, is to make this something that you can, um, you know, something you can give to kids in school, something you can use in classrooms, um, something that can make just like a one-time purchase of um, this year's edition, because I will continue putting out research articles at least for the, for, at least for the next year. You know, I can't promise too much about the future, but as far as year two goes, I have no intention of stopping my research articles. So this time next year, there will be 52 additional Fossil Friday posts, 52 additional Wildlife Wednesdays. Um, that's going to total up to what? Uh, that, that's going to total up to a lot of, of images, a lot more text. Um, my aim is definitely to hit 100,000 words by the end of the year. And uh, who knows, maybe I can uh, double 86,000 by next year, you know, try, try to hit like 160K words. And that's going to be kind of a beefy, <laughs> that would be a bit of a beefy novel. Um, but I'm just not a concise person, you know. I, I, I will take as many words as I need to get across the idea. So in total, um, yeah, so uh, over 100 articles published in that first year. That's between research notes, um, bonus blogs, Q&As, all that stuff. So over 100 articles. And just this year, I've published 20 expedition videos. 14 of which were out in the Menifee Formation. Um, and then the rest are split between the Naco, Fort Crittenden, and Moreno Hill. My intention is to put out another two or three expedition videos before the end of this year, and then to do just kind of just kind of keep on and, and see how many more I can I can pull off in year two. Because I think those videos, I think that content is especially, like, informative for people to see a fossil expedition from my point of view. So I think that, that stuff is definitely worth taking time off. And as PT Paleo continues to grow, um, I'm able to justify taking more time to go run trips. Um, the only thing that stops me from being out collecting fossils every single weekend is that I literally cannot afford to. So, um, you know, that's that's how this stuff works. The more support I get, the more I'm able to produce, and hopefully the more people that are able to enjoy it. So as long as we can kind of keep up, as long as I can keep up the momentum, um, I'm hopeful that people will continue to enjoy what I make. And... Uh, You know, um, through this whole ordeal, since I graduated up till this day, I have been looking for traditional employment, and it just, it's a, it's a extremely rough, uh, 
uh, you know, it's it's hard to get hired right now. Period. I think. Um, extraordinarily tough, and so, you know, this, this isn't all just for fun. You know, this this is um, this is something that I take quite seriously. Uh, let's see. What do I cross out what I've already talked about? We did those stats, 20 expedition videos. Um, everything I've published so far, all of those articles are up are, are subject to future revisions. Um, and I intend to start going back, you know, as soon as possible, as soon as next week, to add more to articles that I've already published. Um, there are some times where I've taken, um, you know, I've, I've done an article on uh, a particular species, and then, um, you know, was able to take, like, a better specimen photo, or, like, learned more information about it organically at a later date, and I was like, oh, well, that would have been useful to know before I went. So um, everything is subject to update. Um, it's only going to get longer and more detailed. So um, if you're if you're a fan of like facts, I don't know. <laughs> Such a stupid thing to say. Let's look at. Let's put on some mammal teeth. This is one that I've already profiled um, for PT Paleo but we're going to look at it anyway. Take more photos. I'm also going to take a quick water break here. Meow. Let's see. I talked about, yes, I want to commission art for illustrated blogs, more videos. Um, paleogeography as well. And, and honestly, this may be something where I just kind of have to bite the bullet and learn it myself because... There doesn't really seem to be that many people who specialize now in paleogeography. Um, a lot of maps of like ancient Earth are all basically made by the same guy, Ron Blakey, uh, who does a very good job. There's a reason he's he is the entire industry on that on that particular type of thing. Um, but in scientific circles, you know, redundancy is actually a good thing. It means there's more people checking, there's more ideas. And part of why I want to be really careful about any kind of forays into ancient reconstructions is that um, there's a lot of assumptions that are made in how to, how to restore a certain thing. Um, there's a lot of assumptions that are made. And if you aren't aware of, of what is based in that reconstruction on, like, original research versus just, um, you know, we don't know. So I had to, I had to pick something, you know, you can end up, uh, perpetuating what are sometimes called paleo memes. You can also just 
refer to them as like you know a motif or whatever something that is is seen consistently but doesn't have a factual basis and that's part of why when I do my research notes when I write all that stuff out um, I don't go to Wikipedia I go to the direct sources that I'm reading from because I have found far more often than you might than you might expect um, Wikipedia will claim something cite a source and I will go to that source and be unable to find un just just unable to find what they're talking about um, the the paper or article that they cite doesn't say what they say it does it's a surprisingly common issue and so you know I would kind of look the fool if I'm if I'm trying to uh, provide as factual information as possible and I end up repeating something uh, because I was copying so that's why I try to do everything as original work and uh, art is just kind of its own it, it's its own like You know, it's a it's a big thing to navigate, and there's a lot of stuff that I still don't know yet. A lot of stuff that I haven't set aside the time to sit down and think about. I can cross that off. Yeah, I'm spending time uh, brushing up on the fundamentals, but also. Um, you know, striking while the iron is hot. I'm fresh out of college, so I've got all these different things swirling around in my head that, um, you know, when you're when you're a year out of college, you you can still be pretty in line with uh, what's new in the field. But when you start getting two or three years out of college, you start missing a lot of stuff. So, you know, now is a good time for me to apply what I've learned before it becomes outdated. There we go. So this is a mammal tooth. Um, I was incorrect. This has actually not been uh, profiled on PT Paleo so far. So you're looking at something that may one day be a uh, be an article. Although it 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 looks so fun in neon that maybe this maybe this is something I do as an abstract print. I don't know. It has made it easier for me to use at art assets, quote unquote, by um, just taking my own pictures of fossils and stuff. Fossils are more artistic than I am in a lot of ways, so I can I can lean on them a little bit. Um, when I was in college, I was not the type of person to take extensive notes all the time, um, because my recall ability is not great. Um, it's certainly something I had to work on. And what I found was um, I had a better chance of being able to work myself through the logic of how to arrive at an answer if I didn't just, you know, write down the answer and then just leave it. You know, everyone kind of studies in a different way. Um, and... I was not the type of person who like sat down and wrote and wrote out everything I needed to keep in mind just because there was no reason to. And again, uh, part of this project has been giving myself an excuse to sit down and actually, you know, while I still have these things straight and clear in my mind, get it written down so that I can use it. Um, the research notes that I've produced are legitimately things that I have gone back and referenced um, when I have forgotten something because it's not easy to keep all the facts in line about all of natural history, 600 million years of, of life on earth. You're not going to remember all the details. So, you know, that's probably the best endorsement that I can give my work anyway, is that it's, it's stuff that I use. So I, you know, switch back to the camera. What a cool little tooth. Cretaceous mammals. So this this is a, a 
an animal that lived alongside the dinosaurs. That nice and bright. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to try to do two or three more expedition videos by the end of this year. Um, my big push every year is the Menifee project. And so now that the Menifee videos are all out, that was kind of my, my big thing for the year, but it's only August. I've still got, you know, I've still got quite a bit of time. So I'm, I'm going to put out a few more things. Um, I'm going to go to a big conference in October, um, the uh, Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. It'll be actually my 10th, um, 10 years since I visited my first SVP, so that's kind of cool. Um, at that point, it, at that time, it was in Los Angeles. This year, it's in Cincinnati. Um, and so that's where you go to kind of get the most up-to-date information on on what's new in research also for students like who's got who's got money who's got grants who's looking for students that's the kind of place you have to go to find out um and there's a lot that i can't talk about while i'm there but um you know, I've, I've considered I may end up writing some bonus blogs or, or maybe even record like a podcast episode or two um, just talking about what's new in paleontology. I have not ventured into into podcasting, really. I've I've uh, guessed I've been a guest spot on a couple of friends podcasts and on a couple of uh, people who've reached out to me like um uh, yeah, but for the most part, um, <laughs> I have been asked by so many people like, you should do a podcast. Do you do a podcast? We should do a podcast together. Um, and when I, when I get the sense they're like, oh, this is something that people are going to have high expectations for, I need to not like half-ass my foray into this. I need to actually like it, it needs to be good. Um, and that's really kind of what holds me back on doing a lot of stuff is like, I've got to, I've got to get around to getting really good at this before I try it, which is not how skills work in the real world, but it is what it is. Um, new types of videos are definitely coming. Um, like I said, I've, I've made videos, for years and years, especially in high school. Um, and I haven't done it in a long time because, or I haven't, I haven't done specific kinds of videos like video essays and other kinds of things, informational stuff in quite a while, because again, there was no reason to, my attention was, um, was directed elsewhere. I was, I was kept really busy with school. Um, school, has always taken up an inordinate amount of my time. And ironically, um, there's a lot that I've learned. I, I, I have learned more in the last year um, about particular types of things, you know, about the fundamentals um, than I have in a long time just because I'm finally able to self-direct my own reading and my own research to a much, you know, much higher degree than uh, was previously possible. So um, I'm going to do more informative videos, um, more of those kinds of things. They will premiere on, again, on Patreon first, and then we'll be on YouTube later. So if you want to sponsor the creation of those things, um, signing up for Patreon is how you do that. If you just want to enjoy it at some point, they will be on YouTube. Um, and, and really what's, what I've been waiting for when I've been working on in the background is building my sets. Um, and my set is kind of my apartment. Um, if you've been inside of where, of where myself and co-host roommate live, um, 
I put a lot of thought into like the decoration and the, the layout of the room and stuff like that. And that's because I kind of see these places as like, that's kind of my set, you know? Like, uh, I don't have a studio. This is the closest thing to it. This is where all my stuff is, so that's my set. And so basically, once I've got my set finished, um, and that includes the garden too, actually. Um, there's a good chance I'm just going to film a lot of stuff out in my garden once it cools down outside. Um, we're kind of back in a little bit of a heat wave situation here in Arizona after... A good week or so of rain the heat has come back but it will not last look at that look at that tooth that's a teeth that's a teeth mm -hmm. it's green yep <laughs> i made it green Roommate co-host will be jumping on shortly. I'm not in uh, Discord or anything. Oh, good then. Yeah. Roommate co-host will not be jumping in shortly. <laughs> but I am on the YouTube stream. Yeah, I've been doing practice streams where I talk with people directly on Discord and... Because of the setup of this, I'm I'm streaming partly from my laptop, um, and uh, you know, it's something it's something I can figure out eventually. My plan is to um, actually um, have like uh, my my subscribers like be able to join to, to like stream it to the PT Paleo Discord, which by the way, um, I I did make a Discord. Um, it's the easiest place to go to kind of catch up with what I'm doing. Um, all the free PT Paleo content is really easy to find on there. So if you're not a subscriber, um, it's still very easy um, to uh, you know it, it's still the best place to kind of access what I what I do what I'm up to um, and uh, yeah as I as I kind of amend um, the PT paleo program and what I provide and by amend I mean add I'm not taking away anything I've previously promised I'm only I'm only adding features and making your subscriptions um, you know even better I'm enha I'm enhancing what you sign up for um, on Discord, I'm going to be doing a lot more stuff on there. My my office hours, which have finally been unlocked, um, I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna be able to commit the time to do my office hours that live Q and A until I had a certain number of uh, donors in that tier. And now that I do, I will be able to get that started. So that that will be part of year two is my office hours. Um, also micro stream also there's a forum in there so that um, there is a place that I feel comfortable directing people to to ask questions because um, I don't really feel comfortable telling people to check out reddit and whatnot um, <laughs> because it's it's a little bit of a hostile situation we got a few new comments on the live chat let me pull that up <laughs> What up, dude? See you at SVP. I will be at SVP, and I will see... Let's see. Oh, that's Cam. Hey, Cam. Good to see you. Yeah, I will I will see you at SVP. Um, it'll be... Um, it, sh it, it should be a lot of fun. I know... I remember you saying on your... Um, uh, on your Kickstarter and, and congratulations, of course, for, um, you know, successfully getting, getting, uh, getting yourself to SVP. That's a big step. It's a really useful thing to do for anyone in any career stage, but, um, you, you're, you're definitely going to enjoy it. Um, 
I just got to figure out how to get myself there because there are not, I just want to take a train, you know, I don't really like being in uh, airplanes anymore. I've kind of gotten too large for them. <laughs> um, by which I mean, I'm like six feet tall and uh, people want you to pay a premium for, uh, you know, leg room. <laughs> And I can't really do that. So yeah, SVP is... Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little story from my first SVP, which was 10 years ago, 2013. Um, I went down to LA. And I was... It, it was a really interesting... Um, the the spa Okay, so SVP is hosted in hotels, as most conferences are. And they managed to pick, I think it's the Hyatt downtown in L.A., um, which is a hotel I had been in before when I was, um, I had been flown in there, and, and that's where I stayed when I was, um, uh, <laughs> how do I even explain this? Uh, I was a contestant on a game show a very long time ago. Um, that would have been in 2009. And I was put up in that same hotel when I was uh, in Hollywood for that weekend. Um, it didn't go well. <laughs> um, and figuring out how to like talk about that situation and how um, the, the writers of the show had not done a good job with their research. And um, they, had, they, they were trying to get us to cheat. And all that stuff. Uh, it was it was a really kind of a gnarly situation, um, and I had like I had lost my episode. I didn't win anything, um, and so th it was it was really kind of a trip to feel when that happened. Like as a ten year old, I was like my career might be over. Like I didn't I didn't you know I didn't win. I didn't uh, I didn't get what I needed, which was you know, basically I was there to try to try to pay for my college. Um, I was there to try to, you know, um, I could have taken home up to half a million dollars, but all I would have needed in retrospect is about 22,000 to pay for my undergraduate. Um, that's all, I, that's really all I was going for. And I, and I didn't get it. Um, and so I, like being in that hotel, I was like, I was in a really, really rough spot the last time. But then SVP a few years later was really kind of a, um, kind of helped me feel like I was back in the fold and that there was actually, um, the real world of paleontology, not this like bizarre, unethical, um, uh, like game show Hollywood version of, of what I had seen. Um, the real thing isn't like that at all. It's, it's, you know, people just genuinely sharing their love of, um, the, of the love of natural history and genuinely excited about teaching new things we learned. Um, probably my favorite memory at SVP 2013 was going to the lectures. So, um, I don't know if you're still on cam, but I'm going to keep talking like you are. Um, there's, uh, I think, three or four days usually of um, talks that are 15 minutes long that happen uh, simultaneously in three different rooms, um, morning session, afternoon session for like three or four days. Um, and so if you want to learn new stuff about what's going on in paleontology, that's where to go. And one, one of the things that I sat in on at SVP that year was an update on <laughs> the skeleton of Dinochirus. So Dinochirus is this, uh, was this kind of anomaly. Um, I mean, it still is. It's a really weird animal, but um, it was a legendary thing for many, many years. It, it it's the name Dinochirus means terrible arms. Terrible it should be interpreted as like fearsome. Um, and all was, all that was known of it were these gigantic arms. 
and it was presumed to be you know maybe from a big predatory dinosaur so a lot of old reconstructions of it have it as like a meat eater and um in the in the very i think maybe late 2000s early 2010s um new skeletons had finally been unearthed of that animal um with arms that go right back moving stuff under the microscope is such a pain because it's all like backwards from what you expect there we go so they they unearthed uh not just one, but a, a pair of new skeletons. And it turns out that the animal uh, was definitely not a carnivore. Um, it, at least it didn't have any teeth, really. Um, had kind of more like a duckbill head and a sail that starts halfway up the back and goes down to the hips. Um, really weird animal. It's in Prehistoric Planet, for anyone who's, who's seen that. Um... <laughs> and um you know that was that was the first time that was when everyone learned all at once you know every paleontologist besides those who were directly involved in that study we all learned at the same time in that room um what dinochirus actually looked like and it was it was definitely something that underscored for me that this is not a solved science that there is always just more to learn and with that we shouldn't take we shouldn't take for granted that like some things will never be solved and that other stuff is like immutable that we can't ever find out new information that challenges what we believe about certain species about certain environments whatever so oh good you're still here so yeah um yeah SV svp is always really fun um you never know who you're gonna run into um you never know, like, what you're going to learn in a poster session and, and all that stuff. So, yeah, it, it, it'll be a good time for sure. And I'm just having a good time looking at uh, neon multi-tuberculate teeth under the microscope. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Yeah, check that out. Let's see, what else do I have on this list? I talked about SVP. Um, did that. Still a ways out to full rollout of my Patreon. Um, yeah, there's still there's still so many other little things that I want to do. Um, and I'm just going to see how much I can pull off in the next year. Just keeping up what I've already done. You know, the Fossil Fridays, Wildlife Wednesdays, bonus blogs. Um, I really want to write more blogs, actually. Um, I really need to step that up, for sure. Because those are those tend to get... Um, first of all, those tend to be free. Those are open access. So they're easier to share around. Um, easy to people, easier, easier to get people to click on. Um, since, obviously, 95% of people just aren't you know they're not if there's a paywall even if it's something they're interested in they aren't going to touch it so i tend to get a lot more readers on those bonus blogs and i've got a lot of stuff to talk about for sure um part of what you know makes svp interesting is that there is a lot of privileged information that you become privy to when you're there um you learn a lot of like in progress research that you're either explicitly or kind of implicitly told like, hey, don't don't talk about this publicly, you know. Um, that's what the Dinochirus thing was. That was all embargoed until the actual paper came out a couple of uh, a couple of months later, something like that. So yeah, it's not it's not super common to have like a reporter go to SVP and like report on all the new things in paleontology because a lot of it is um, sensitive information that uh, it's it's not for it's not for you you know to it, go and like break the news on that stuff. You have to let researchers uh, publish their own stuff and, and be given the chance to talk about their work. 
What else do I want to pull up? Let's do Masadma. Let's get this little guy up here. This is a teeny, teeny, tiny little mammal tooth. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still thinking, um, if, if I can, maybe at the end of the day, while I'm at SVP, um, this, this time I'm hoping to be there the whole week because I'm not in school currently, and, uh, I still don't have a regular job, so there's no reason I have to, you know, I, I can't stay for a week, so I might as well actually be there for the whole thing for once. Let's turn that light down actually see something. There we go. So this is Masadma. This is another little mammal from uh, this particular tooth is from Hell Creek, so this is a Cretaceous mammal, but this genus actually survives um, into the Paleocene. So there's the big old extinction that kills off the dinosaurs, most of them anyway, and uh, most, you know, it's not like birds were immune. Um, that's kind of a common misconception. Birds, sur Some birds do survive the KPG extinction, but a lot of them still go extinct. Um, turtles survive the KPG extinction, but a lot of them still go extinct. Um, crocodilians, which is really kind of what I specialize in for some reason. It's what a lot of my publicate. It's what my um, my last publication is was on, and what the next one is also about is the crocodilians of the Campanian, which is also late Cretaceous. It's a little bit earlier than this guy. And uh, yeah, I mean crocs as, you know, members of that group do survive, but, like, there's a ton that don't. Cool. So this is one that I, de I definitely have profiled on the Patreon. So that article is out there. For now, we're just see what kind of weird uh, neon. See what I can do with this guy. Let's see. Um, I mentioned the Discord, but I'll say it again. Um, right now, I'm kind of like retracting my presence on the internet. Um, Here's another another good announcement. From from my perspective, it's good. Um, last week, I finally looked at Twitter.com, which is not even called that anymore. And I was like, you know what? It really hasn't helped me career-wise and certainly not, like, <laughs> mental health-wise to be on this website. And it is just falling apart so quickly that, you know what, I think, you know, I, I gave it a shot, but I think it's more than time to call it quits. And so I, I cleared, I think, 2,000 or so tweets um, to the point where the website wouldn't even load my page anymore, and, I, and I'm like, all right, that's good enough, so I closed the account. So I'm off Twitter, thank God. Um, but it also means that, like, if, if you're someone trying to find what I'm up to and what I do, um, it's, it's not going to be quite as easy to just go on social media because I am, I am done <laughs> wading through uh, just the noxious pits of just everything that goes on on there. I just can't take it anymore. Um, so if, if uh, I should probably drop that in the, in the chat, actually invite to the discord that's where i post you know updates to my research um all the free content that i make for pt paleo is also up there so it's definitely not just for subscribers but if you are a subscriber you really should go there because um, that's where you find the full resolution uh, images for my research notes and um it's the easiest way to reach me for sure 
is through Discord. One second, doing this on my phone. Doing this on my phone. For anyone that joins that wants to, there's the Discord invite. So anyway, I plugged that. I'm going to shut up about it now. Um, <laughs> I'm not moving to Instagram. I'm not moving to threads. I'm not moving to Blue Sky. I, I really, I have, been on, I have been on that part of the internet for too long, and it has taken too much of a toll on me, and I, I'm, I'm just stepping away, so... Look at that. I like the little uh, figure eight slash infinity sign. That's really kind of cool. Look at that. What else do we have here? Um, I finally released a glossary. Um, that page is public. So anyone who wants to look at uh, my glossary, my bibliography, and my index for uh, the Parent-Teacher Guide to Paleontology. That's all up, that's all open access. Um, yeah, the glossary, even though I still have way more I need to write, uh, way, way more I need to write on like every single entry. I need to add like dozens of new entries and all that. Um, just, just publishing this first version of it, V1.0, um, it's, it's about 5% of my total published work on, on Patreon period. So it's a, it's a long document and, um, my bibliography on there shows you, um, what specific papers. So on, on each of the research articles, I say which scientific papers I read in preparation for writing that piece. Um, and on the, uh, glossary bibliography page, I have all those listed in alphabetical order now, um, it includes, uh, you know, references for pages that haven't been published yet. So, so right now, of all the articles currently published, there's over 300 scientific papers referenced. Um, if you go to the bibliography right now, it says I have 370-something articles on there. That's because I've added a bunch of... Um, there's a bunch of references in there for pages that haven't been published yet. So if you're curious about what I'm going to write about in the next probably three, four months, something on something like that, you can kind of just go look through the bibliography and search for, you know, animals, names, and things that you don't see on the regular index. Fun little Easter egg activity for, I don't know. I don't know why you would do that, but if you want to, there you go. It is Masodma Tooth. Um, I don't know why this is written down here on my stream notes, uh, but this bullet point says, I think it's a sin to roleplay as your pet on the internet. I guess that was my way of introducing the idea that, like, um, while I do kind of use my cat sometimes uh, in, like, promotional stuff for my page, um, the, like... If, if I wanted to be, like, popular and successful on social media, I would just roleplay as my cat because people like cats way more than they like people. Um, it's just that I think that that's crazy. <laughs> I just think it's kind of... Uh, it's just not what I want to do. And that's, that's really why I've kind of... I'm still finding my place on... On, on Al Gore's internet and how I'm supposed to share my research and my work because um, there's, there's all kinds of things that you, if you want to get attention on YouTube, if you want to get attention on Instagram, you want to get attention on Twitter, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do that just feels just crazy and weird and it's uncomfortable for me and I, I just don't want to. So, like, 
I'm not I'm not gonna role play as August on the internet. Don't worry about that. But I am still gonna post pictures of her everywhere because she's incredibly cute. I don't know where she is right now though. It's uh, 2 p.m. in the afternoon where I am, so that it's nap time, obviously. But I'm not sure where she's ended up. She could either be in the cabinet under the sink. She's not under my desk. Tuberculate. New types of videos are coming. I've been building a set. I talked about that. Um, I'm going to keep filming videos and stuff in my garden, but I also have, you know, my my work desk where this microscope is. I've got um, my home office, quote unquote, where co-host roommate is uh, currently hanging out. That's where their desk is. Um, but that that whole area. You know, I again, I've I've kind of built everything to kind of look like a set that I can use as a set. So I'll definitely film videos in there too. Once we're once we're done with the decorations, unfortunately, I'm I'm never quite done tweaking the decoration. So it'll, that'll that'll be in a little while. I really like uh, this is just cool. Check that out, blue and red. Let's see. Um, in deciding what I wanted to do for PT Paleo, um, I wanted as much of it to be original content as possible because there's all kinds of, obviously copyright is a big deal um, and that slows you down as far as what you're able to do with, with what's been produced. And so one of the ways that you can ensure that everything you've made um, you know, remains yours and that you call the shots on how it's developed and and you only need your permission to use it in, in this, that, and the other kind of application. Oh, this is still the frozen image. Close. Okay. So, um, yeah, the, there's been a huge emphasis for me on, on doing just original work as much as possible and I'm hopeful that that pans out in the future. By the way, Cam, if you're still on, um, I know that you, you've obviously got a YouTube channel um, and you do lots of, uh, you know, videos and trips like out to uh, different local outcrops, which is something that, that I do as well. If you ever wanted to, um, I'll, I'll put it this way, if, if you ever wanted to try something like this, do a Patreon, where you let people support you to to do those runs out to you know uh, different outcrops in the southeast, I think you would do incredibly well. I'll just I'll just put it that way. Um, you've got a lot of support in the community, and um, I think if you let people give you support in that way, I think they will. I would definitely encourage you to try that out. Um, this whole Patreon. You know, there, there are paleontologists who use Patreon. Mark Witten is, is very prolific on here. Um, he makes a, a lot of money doing this, but he's also, like, a very well-established researcher. So, like, I'm not in the same league as a Mark Witten. But um, just because this industry is so difficult to break into, it's so hard to get academic jobs. Academic jobs want you to, you know, move far away from where you grew up and, and your support networks and all that. Um, I, I, I just think there's a lot of potential for people in this industry to use platforms like this to garner support. And um, I'm trying to prove for myself that you, you kind of can, that, that this does work. Um, that people who are not uh, commercial paleontologists and people who are not artists specifically can still use platforms like this. Um, what else do I got? Uh, in school, so there's a lot of stuff that, like, I wasn't... I, I, I graduated... Um, what bothered me the most is when I graduated, still not, like, understanding 
how to do basic like civic what I call civic e ecological um, you know aspects of civic ecology I didn't know how to compost you know I didn't learn how to like keep living things alive we learned about plants but we didn't spend much time with them really um, and so like honestly a lot of that first six months out of college for me was just building like my garden as a place of like mental health refuge but also just a place to experiment with how do I keep a living thing alive um, how do I break down you know organic um, matter into soil all of these things are are important teachers in biology and and in paleontology too that's the beauty of this work is that we study everything we study every aspect of the earth's history and so there's really no type of earth science that you can branch into that doesn't also give you um you know doesn't doesn't uh, recursively also give you like new insights into the fossil record so in learning how to compost i learned like how stuff decays and what what circumstances and what like conditions taphonomic conditions is what we call them like make things break down faster versus how you know what circumstances what situations make stuff break down slower um in composting the goal is to uh have stuff break down in fossilization the hope if you're a scientist is that stuff doesn't just melt away you know um so you know I, i've learned a lot of practical skills in that time um but by fundamentals i also mean like you know some of my fossil friday posts have been about invertebrates some of them have been about plants some of them have been about um types of mammals and reptiles that i didn't focus on in school because they're not local um and so uh yeah in in doing this work I've, I've been able to brush up on a lot of fundamental stuff. And I can, you know, I can only hope that it's, it's also been valuable for uh, some of the other students um, who, who follow me. Uh, for example, um, I'm hoping she's able to join um, a live stream or maybe an office hour someday, but I, I have a student in China who signed up uh, for for PT Paleo a long time ago, she's one of the original uh, supporters, and uh, she sends me questions all the time, and it, it's just really cool catching up with her and learning about the Chinese academic system and how different it is from how education works here in the U.S. and and mostly how like education doesn't work here in the U.S. You know, um, I live in Arizona and we're consistently in the bottom two or three states as far as like. Uh, per student spending and and just general education so it's it's just interesting to see like when when a society like invests in education how different everything looks and how like as someone going into middle school she is um obviously fluent in mandarin but she speaks like she's she speaks awesome she's she's like very very good at english um and it's it's just cool to work with kids who um kind of recognize what i'm going for and and are all in you know i i'm always looking for someone who has the people who have the same energy and the same passions for just um learning for the sake of learning and you know, not not recycling the same conversations over and over, but what new things can we look into? You know. Um, here's another random thing that I stuck on here. I know how to scuba dive. I haven't done it in a really long time, but I do have a an open dive certification that I got when I was um, in Boy Scouts, so a long, long time ago. Excuse me. 
And so, for example, like, um, I never got to use that, uh, I never got to use that certification for looking for fossils. One of the main reasons why I wanted to get scuba certified was so that I could go out, out east into places like Florida, um, where you have river deposits that have fossils in them. And if you can scuba dive, you can, you can go down into these beds that just have like, you know, mammoth teeth and, and shark teeth and, Glyptodonts, capybaras, uh, forest rockets, um, saber-toothed cats, deer, like all kinds of stuff. Um, so when I say that there's that, you know, I'm only doing maybe 5%, or not 5%, maybe a quarter to a third of what I, what I envision being, uh, Peyti Paleo being capable of doing, like... I want to be able to do at least a couple expedition videos where I'm scuba diving like underwater, you know? There's 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 so much more stuff that I want to do. So um, if anyone's worried that I'm going to plateau after year one, that I'm just going to kind of stick to the way that things are, um, I, I am still looking to impress. I still feel like I need to, to prove myself in, in some ways. And also, just how, how fun would it be to try to film <laughs> finding fossils underwater, you know? Let's put Masatma away. See what else I can bring out. Look at that. Isn't that cool? Look at that. Let's see if I can do some amber. Let's see how that turns out. One moment. Let's see. Um, yeah, so on, on the subject of like art and wanting to commission art for these projects, um, Art is a highly technical skill um, that requires a lot of practice. There we go. You can kind of see a little bug. Let's make some adjustments. Um, but it also requires extensive research. And like I mentioned earlier, um, you can definitely accidentally um, replicate someone else's like filler ideas and stuff like that without even realizing um, and uh, so all this stuff requires so much like research and um, really careful attention to detail and stuff like that so um, you know artists deserve you know they ask for a lot, but if you're if you're trying to get something high quality out of someone, the amount of research that really should be going into it and the amount of effort it takes, um, it's it's noteworthy and it's also really worth it. You know, um, 
part of the joys of doing this work is bringing something to life, being part of the process of presenting something new to the public that they didn't know before. And we use all these like bizarre methods of acquiring arcane knowledge um, that honestly doesn't get nearly enough uh, attention versus just like the the discoveries or whatever. But um, having artists working with you is is a big part of um, looking at the big picture, looking at things through the lens of the general public. Um, and it's, it's just, it's, it's really, really cool. So, um, yeah, my, my goal, and there's a lot of stuff that, uh, the pledges that I get through Patreon, there's a lot of things that those need to go for. And one of them is definitely art commissions. So, um, that's, that's one thing. Another aspect is quite honestly, um, all the stuff I do for my home computer that I have been, uh, I've been upgrading it since I, I bought it. Um, I bought a pre-built in, I think, 2013, maybe 2012. And I've been replacing parts kind of as I go since then. So, like, um, you know, my hard drives are quite old. I've got, a you know, a graphics card that can handle... Um, rendering videos and can render and can handle having like a dozen tabs in Photoshop open, which is necessary when I'm making my research notes. So I produce all those in Photoshop. Um, but there, you know, there's always the risk of components breaking down. And um, one of the things that I need to invest time in for sure, uh, and well, and I need to invest money in is getting my home desktop, getting all that, um, you know, modernizing it, making it so everything runs more smoothly so that I can start tackling like much more intensive projects. Um, there's all kinds of cool video stuff that you can do, but I wouldn't even try it right now because I don't think uh, I don't think my PC would handle you know trying to render like a multi-hour long thing. I think it would really struggle with that. Um, yeah. Cool little bug. I do have information on these pieces somewhere. Um, <laughs> it's in my desk somewhere. It's also sometimes written on the bottom of the specimen, but I'm not going to pick it up while I'm trying to get it to focus under the camera, obviously. I think I've actually talked about pretty much a lot, you know, I've, I've, I've already mentioned a lot of the stuff that I wanted to talk about as far as, um, you know, looking forward to the future on PT Paleo, on, on this project. Um, ooh. Why he purple? I just really like turning everything purple, I guess. Um, so yeah, it, it was a strategic choice for me to, to pick that platform. There are obviously advantages and drawbacks to it. Um, partly, I mean, one major pro, uh, drawback is the fact that like, I can't, there's, there's a lot of uh, spaces that I can't share my work in because they have a hostile sort of attitude towards like, they'll see a Patreon link and they'll be like, you know, pe people get, you know, 
there, there are spaces where it's really not welcome. And if uh, you, you know, this is something that I feel I, I really feel I have to do this um, in order to continue building my skills as a scientist and just do the very basic human thing of trying to survive. Um, that's it's a choice that I had to make, and unfortunately means that certain parts of uh, the internet I'm kind of shut out of now. But that's okay because um, doing this work, doing this project has has just been awesome. Like for I mean, even just for my own mental health, honestly, um, because this is what I'm good at, and this is what I like doing, and so much of being in school as I was finishing up my college degree was spending time doing stuff that I'm just bad at um, or just not not as good at and being made to feel like I'm only as good as my least um, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm only as good as my worst skill you might say um, and that that kind of stuff just wears you really wears you down over time so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just been great to sit down and, and just, just read sometimes, you know? Making the videos, making those expedition videos, um... I talked about this a lot in the last stream I did where I was playing FTL. Uh, and I think I'm going to play FTL again, by the way. Um, I, I like doing the kind of non... The kind of unserious little game streams. So I think, I think in future I'm going to kind of do both. Do my little paleo stream, my micro stream, and then uh, the less serious, just play a game and, and have fun. Isn't that neat? Look at that. You can't tell me that someone wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't buy that as a print, you know? Let's try a different piece of amber. So we got, we got going on over here. Let's see. It's another little insect in, in amber, obviously. adjust some of this exposure make it easier to see
Hello, I see another couple people just joined. Right now we're looking at an insect in amber under the microscope. I've got uh, so many weird tints applied to it um, that it looks just nuts. But I think it's cool, so. And I'm talking about, uh, this is, I've just completed one year of my um, independent science writing project on Patreon called the Parent Teacher Guide to Paleontology. I put a link in the chat uh, to join the Discord for all the different kind of work that I do, but a lot of my Patreon stuff that's available for free is linked on there. So that's all available to check out. Um, part of year two, which is starting, I guess, now will be uh, sorting fossils under the microscope. I'm trying to do live streams uh, somewhat regularly, hopefully a couple times a month, where I'm gonna look at sediment that I collect under the microscope to look for tiny creatures. And uh, that's kind of a way for me to bring the excitement of discovery in the field uh, to people uh, in the comfort of your home, from the comfort of my home. Amber five. I need to ad physically adjust the microscope, so excuse me if my voice gets quiet. Let's see how that does. There we go. I think I needed to adjust it in the other direction. Back when I was working under this scope during the pandemic, uh, there was a huge wildfire. Um, huge wildfire in town, uh, on the north side of town, that we were all kind of dealing with at the same time that everything else was happening. <laughs> Um, but one of the cool things was what, what we were looking for in those sediments was uh, little pieces of charcoal that we could use to study. Um, yeah, I've just completely lost it now. Uh, pieces of charcoal that we were using to study uh, the evolution of like grassland wildfires in East Africa. Um, and so it was just interesting to be helping to study wildfires while a wildfire was happening in my backyard and thinking about, not in my backyard, but um, I mean, in the case of my boss, who I was working for literally in his backyard, uh, he almost had to evacuate because of it. There's a nice big bug on this one. I've just made this all kinds of messy, haven't I? Okay. That's getting closer. There we go. Fortunately, when you're working with amber, it can definitely be hard to get that glare to go away if it turn off auto exposure.
Come on. There we go. Isn't that cool? I just wish I could get that glare to go away. If you're hanging out, feel free to uh, leave a message in the chat or tell me, uh, leave any questions you might have, because I am just taking an easy afternoon doing whatever. It's kind of like a little antenna right there. It keeps coming into focus. Let's check that out. You guys see that? I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it's like... Yes, hello to you from the other side of the apartment. As well. We went out to uh, get some sushi last night, and my god, did I uh, <laughs> order too much. Um, I, it was ambitious. I gave it, I gave it my all, but ordered way too much. And fortunately, the uh, manager was was very nice and and did not like make us pay out the teeth for over ordering for all you can eat. Um, but I was like coming out of the restaurant. I was like, I, I don't think I can eat sushi ever again. I think I ate so much that I'm done forever. And, uh, when I'm done with the stream, I'm going to go eat my leftovers because, uh, sushi is unfortunately delicious. And, uh, as, as sick of it as you can get, um, in no time at all, it's all you can think about again. Crazy how that happens. Yeah, look at that little antenna right there. Interesting. All right, I'll take I'll take one picture like this, and then I'm gonna mess around with the uh, tint and stuff. See what kind of crazy things I can make with this. Number five. Nope, that's still the picture. So yeah, this is not a, uh, this is called an Amscope FMA050. It's not a, you know, it's not a fancy schmancy microscope or anything. It's a dissection microscope, technically. 
Um, but it's as far as just something to have here at home. Um, very convenient just to have on a on a nearby desk ready to go if I need to look at something close up. I don't know if uh, she's still in the chat, but someone in here once uh, broke a tooth in half at my apartment, and uh, we looked at it under the microscope. I just want that glare to go away, you know? Let's try one more piece of amber. This one is an ant from uh, the Eocene, 55 million years old, from Kaliningrad. So this is Eastern Europe. See if I can prop this up on something. Get that glare out of the way. You guys can see it, right? That's just an ant. Isn't that cool? Just an ant in there. Look at that. Wow. Maybe I should just photograph, uh, do amber photography for the rest of my life. I don't know.
I hope you guys are enjoying Neon Ant stream. Should I, what color should I try to go for? Let's try to make this guy green. Wow. <laughs> this is what it feels like to chew five gum, I think. Just kidding, I'm not sponsored. Far from it. I'm going to be right back. You guys hang tight. Just wanted to scarf down some leftover sushi.
Yes, the ant has bisexual lighting. Congratulations. put the ant away. Uh, let's look at some eggshell. Let's do that. There we go. Try to get this uh, deep fried coloration out. That may prove to be a difficult task, actually. <laughs>
Yeah, I guess this one's just going to be a little bit hard to really make out. Um, but it is a piece of a uh, titanosaur, which are some of the big, uh, big long neck dinosaurs. A piece of a titanosaur eggshell. Um, eggs from these animals are actually not all that rare. There are certain areas, like in South America and in Europe and in Asia, that have just generation after generation, thousands of years worth of nesting animals just leaving eggshells behind. And uh, what, you know, those little divots that you're seeing, those are um, pores that would have been used for gas exchange. Um, embryonic animals need to breed, I mean, uh, breathe, just like anything else. Um, embryos should not be breeding, ideally. That's kind of kind of gross but yeah you're you're uh, whether it's a chicken or a crocodile or a dinosaur the embryo needs to be able to breathe and exchange co2 for fresh oxygen so that's what all these little holes there are for Swap that one out for a different eggshell. There we go. This is an eggshell from some kind of Ovaraptorosaur from China. There's all those little bumps on there. Well, that's ornamentation. Those aren't pores for gas exchange, I don't think. But I have also not uh, directly studied fossilite eggs, really. Um, they're not exactly common. And there aren't places to collect dinosaur eggshell easily in Arizona. There is, there is some known. A very small amount. What's interesting is that its actual color is kind of more of a kind of an adobe, kind of a reddish brown. But in the scope, because I've been messing around with the color settings, it's like white.
I'm gonna put this up while I swap out specimens again. I'm gonna try to look at some reptile skull bones next. So these are from a critter called Dola Serpitin from the Permian of Oklahoma. Focus. Unfortunately, reptile skull bones are <laughs> super duper uh, complex. And it's not always really obvious what uh, each thing actually is. This long one, I believe, is going to be a little jaw piece from those serrations. Let me see if I can get that in focus. There we go. You guys see those grooves on there? Now you can't. Oh, wait. So Richard Spur is kind of an interesting location where these fossils came from. It's a big deposit in uh, Oklahoma. Um, and it's a Permian-aged cave deposit. Um, the Permian is a period of time that comes right before the Mesozoic, right before the so-called age of the dinosaurs. And uh, so the Permian is kind of seen as like... Um, 
all the you know progenitors of what would become uh, the ancestors of dinosaurs were there obviously um, mam- the ancestors of mammals were really starting to take on unique adaptations and set themselves apart from other types of reptiles um, and that's the time when like Dimetrodon which is not a dinosaur was uh, knocking around and a similar sail backed reptile Adaphosaurus and its relatives they were also knocking around um, and so Richard's spur as a cave deposit is just kind of this unique aggregation of really small reptiles and stuff that probably would not be super likely to preserve otherwise. Uh, caves are, are kind of unique in that way. Um, there's some fossil caves here in Arizona. One of them is fairly close to Tucson. Um, and that stuff preserves. It's all Pleistocene, so it's ice-aged animals. Um, ground sloths. Uh, ground sloths are a big one because they are kind of naturally cave inhabiting. There's these huge networks of caves in Brazil that have been attributed to giant ground sloths. Another uh, specimen I uh, profiled for Fossil Friday was this uh, uh, wallaby jaw that also came from a cave deposit, but from Australia, as you might imagine, called Notomacropus, which is a fun, fun word to say. Notomacropus. Notomacropus. Who up no to their Macropus? That might be a fun guy to look at under the camera. Let me go grab him. Yeah, do it. This is a D20. It's not a fossil, but... Um, I don't want to... <laughs> Here. I'll let you move. Yeah. Put Dolacerpitin away. So, just stick it right there. <laughs> oh my god. There you go. D20. It's backwards. 
I'm gonna have to like reset to default all of these things. I've I mess with them so bad, but like, look at the look at the look at look look it's very cool. look look at the look look the material. I see. I don't like touching my computer. I'm gonna be honest, I'm a huge sucker for like very oversaturated pictures. <laughs> like that. <laughs> okay. Let's put let's put the wallaby. So yeah, I can't tell a difference between the two. Yeah. You, you should definitely be able to tell in this one. Okay. One second. You can sort of see what the colors are. Oh, yeah. That's kind of cool. Thank And I will keep this one. I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons for years. Uh, and it took a year-long campaign for someone else to finally be like, you should get dice. And I'm like, so true. You're so right about that. Anyway, this is uh, Nota Macropus. Colored uh, neon pink in honor of the Barbie movie. I don't know. <sighs> Let me try to... Let's see. That's a little closer to its true color. Look at his little teeth. Those are the little molars in the back of the jaw. Kind of pick it up and angle it. I can be your angle or your devil. They say, don't look a gift wallaby in the mouth, uh, but this wasn't a gift, so. You can see it's got um, sediment covering uh, portions of that tooth. I haven't tried like cleaning it, doing any prep on it. I probably won't just because if it wasn't prepped off by the collector, it's probably not meant to be prepped off. Probably uh, be more destructive to try to remove it. That's pretty close to true color.
Wow. Some of the grooves down there in that lower part of the jaw. And then, same teeth, just from the other side. Uh, what you're looking at right now is the labial view, which means these are the cheek facing side of the teeth. And the other one was the lingual, lingual view, which is the tongue-facing side of the teeth. It's like a horror, like... No, don't save over. Three, there we go.
All right, I'm gonna go find maybe one or two more specimens for calling the stream good. Two more we're gonna look at. First one is another mammal jaw. This is Leptomyrix or Leptomyrix, depending on how you feel like saying it. The cool thing about Latin is that it's a dead language and no one can correct you for your pronunciation. Nothing is strictly speaking wrong. So. I just pick whatever pronunciation is most fun for me to say, regardless of what a uh, someone who works in the classics, whatever you would call those, classicists, I don't know. And Leptomerix is a uh, little deer guy. swap that out with a little guy called Carpopeneus Septum Spinatus. 
Gates is another guy that I profiled for Fossil Friday a uh, long time ago, back in like January or something. Although I may have, I probably wrote the article a lot earlier than that. That's the front of him. There's all the little legs. It's the antenna. And over here is the tail. There's his face. Isn't that cool? Party shrimp, party shrimp. You know what I find interesting is every time I start making everything neon, the view count goes back up. I wonder what I wonder what that's all about. do it like that it kind of looks like a cave painting doesn't it okay so with all that said and done I have, I have gone through pretty much everything that I wanted to discuss, um, just kind of giving a rundown for uh, what working on the Parent-Teacher Guide to Paleontology has meant for the last year, and how, um, you know, as, as difficult as it is for anyone to make concrete plans and promises about the future, I am definitely, definitely giving this another year. Um, so anyone who wants to give that stuff a look, um, if you're obviously a parent or a teacher who is interested in paleontology, or if you have a student um, in your life, a young person in your life who's really enthusiastic about this stuff, and you're looking for resources, um, that's a great place to check out. 
at least I think so. Um, if you're just someone who's interested in paleontology, you're not a student, a parent, or a teacher, and you just want to learn more about this stuff directly from the source and not secondhand through, you know, internet forums or just the general chatter, um, you know, I encourage you to check it out as well. I always forget to mention this, but you can get a, a seven-day free trial. Carpobanes. Um, you can get a seven-day free trial to the uh, basic tier, the um, PT Paleo subscription, uh, for a week for free. And what that means is if you really wanted to, uh, you know, you, you can sign up for that and it'll unlock all of the research articles that I've written already. So you can go on a reading spree for about seven days. And if at that point you still don't think that it's worth three dollars a month this uh, you know the free trial ends and you don't have to worry about it um, if you want to support the continued creation of this stuff and um, all the other things that I'm hoping to start doing in this next year as part of uh, year two of this project um, please do consider um, it's only three dollars a month you can't even get a cup of coffee for that price anymore and it's going directly to a young scientist who definitely can use it. Um, if you're interested in uh, being able to ask Q and A's and and doing um, access to my old Q and A's, asking new questions and getting answers, um, that's also available. That's six bucks a month. Again, um, you can't even get Netflix for six dollars a month anymore. So, not that I'm, like, on the level of Netflix, but um, if you're someone who wants to help contribute to, you know, the understanding of, of natural history and uh, the creation of these kinds of materials and all that kind of stuff, um, all I can do is uh, I can show you guys all the stuff that's available for free on Patreon. If you go to that page, um, there's a public tab so you can see all the stuff that's publicly available. If you join the Discord link that's in the description, you'll also be able to, um, well, you'll access the Discord where I post updates and all kinds of stuff, and you can also see the list of publicly available articles. Um, if the idea of seeing um, an expedition and, and being debriefed on my digs, and that includes in dinosaur age formations in New Mexico and 300 plus million year old formations in Arizona, um, 70 million year old formations close to town here where I live in Tucson. Um, if you're interested in not only supporting that work, but also getting to see what I found um, on that exact same day, you can sign up as an expedition donor, which is um, the top and most prestigious tier. I really appreciate everyone who contributes on that level because uh, with $12 a month, I can actually do some, some considerable damage, right? Um, you know, that gets me uh, the 12 bucks. It's about two gallons of gas, <laughs> maybe three. Um, yeah, about three. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's help with, uh, car maintenance. That's help with, um, other kinds of camp supplies that I need. Um, the money that I raise through this is going to, um, all those kinds of things. There's, uh, you know, uh, tech, there's tech upgrades that I need to make that I'm hoping to make in order to have the expedition videos, higher quality, Stuff like microphones, stuff like, uh, you know, higher picture quality. Maybe someday I can get a better camera. Um, and uh, fortunately, I, I guess I'll do one last um, announcement. Some good news that I got today. So the, the previous good news was uh, that I closed my Twitter account <laughs> last week. Um, today I got confirmation that my um, income-based... Uh, student loan repayment plan has been approved and what that means is my because I make less I make way less than this by the way um, because I make less than thirty thousand dollars a year as a uh, single um, 
filing as as uh, single, not married, whatever. Um, a f- my my monthly payment is zero dollars, and that's a big deal because otherwise they'd be expecting a couple hundred from me a month, and that's about twice what I currently make on Patreon, which is uh, my income source at the moment. Because uh, finding someone to employ a paleontologist for anything that isn't paleontology turns out to be very difficult. Um, so all, all that said, um, you know, if you're if you are a student, if you've graduated in the last couple of years, make sure you go to your loan servicer and request it's specifically the the uh, Save Act, the Save Repayment Plan. Um, if you're in that threshold of making less than thirty k a year make sure to go apply for income-based repayment. Um, and you should also be aware that, uh, I mean, I noticed, I don't know if this is was just a me situation or if it's happened to other people, but um, your loan servicer is not allowed to add interest um, to your payments that, like, your, your account can't be charged for interest um, after the, uh, you know, COVID forbearance was applied a couple of years ago, and that does unfortunately end in September. So interest is going to be applied to those loans again, but I caught my service provider, Advantage, adding hundreds, hundreds of dollars, over $600 in interest on loans that are not applic that are, there are, there's no interest applied yet. Um, so you know, make sure you you check that stuff. Don't assume that they won't do goofy stuff like that. Uh, never assume that a big company won't make errors in their favor, if you know what I mean. Take one last picture of Carpopeneus. And uh, with that, I think I'm going to sign off. Um, again, thanks everyone for joining the stream, watching videos, uh, following the Patreon. Um, it, it all means a ton. I really want to keep putting energy into this and do stuff that's bigger, more impressive, more comprehensive, um, because there is a need, at least in my view. Um, I'm trying to make things that I wish I had when I was first starting out and that I wish that my parents would have, would have had when they were first starting out. Um, just as far as guidance on how to how to get into the field, what the basics are of paleontology. Um, if you're, you know, if you're in your 30s or whatever, and even your 40s, and you've got kids now, um, and you're relying on knowledge that you gained about, you know, you're, you're trying to answer questions they have about dinosaurs, but they're 30 or 40 years out of date from when you were a kid. A lot of stuff has changed since then, and. Um, it's getting harder and harder to locate that information on like Google. Google is becoming a lot less helpful in situations like that. And I, you know, I'll tell you right now, I go on places like Twitter, uh, before I closed my account last week, I'd go, I go on places like Reddit and I see where people with those curious inquisitive minds are trying to get answers to those questions. And there's a lot of the times the highest rated you know, answers to those are just straight up wrong, um, or they're highly opinionated, they're misleading, they're not coming from, from experts or from people who won't go find a specialist in that question to answer. They're just going to make up whatever they can on the spot. Um, and I say all that because I think it's not a, it's, it, it's not a bad thing to go seek expert advice. And, if you want to learn more about paleontology for any reason, whatever situation you're in, or if you just want to support a young scientist, um, you've got the links to check out. And uh, I'm going to check out too. So, The next stream hopefully will be probably about two weeks from now. Um, I'm going to be sorting matrix under the microscope, and we're going to be looking for new fossils. Um, I can't say where those fossils where you know where that matrix has come from quite yet I need to get some uh, confirmation first that I can sort those particular fossils on stream but um, yeah that's the plan I'm gonna start uh, doing this it might be like a Monday evenings thing I don't know um, 
I'm still trying to feel out like where Paleo Stream goes in the in the schedule because I've got Wildlife Wednesdays on Wednesday, Fossil Friday on Fridays. I want my weekends off. Honestly, I've I have have gotten so bad after leaving school and even in school. Honestly, of just pushing, of just working all the time, and so I'm trying not to put so much pressure. Uh, that I'm I'm also doing like multi-hour streams every other weekend. So maybe a Monday night thing after you're back from school and you want uh, something nice to treat yourself to. Treat yourself to a Paleo Stream. And you know what? Treat yourself to a PT Paleo subscription too, because they're not expensive and it's cool information. And uh, who doesn't like fossils? You know. All right, I've been I've been jabbering on long enough. Thanks for watching. See you next time.